Okay. Uh, my name is Kami, and uh, I am. Uh, I have been doing software development for pretty damn long time. Uh, <coughs> uh, today, I am sharing. Uh, so I, I actually talked about this uh, a few months ago in a different speech, and this is for let's say extended version of uh, a 20 minute talk. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be under time because <laughs> I won't be like speaking at 100 percent slower. Um, but uh, feel free to stop me. Um, I, feel, I figured out this is mostly engineering background. I don't even have to explain a lot of things. Um, so that's awesome. So, uh, so the topic I sort of set up for today was coding with realist robots. I uh, work in uh, Line Fukuoka. So, anybody don't know Line, isn't here? <laughs> okay. So, it's a it's a semi-popular messenger uh, 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 in in East Asia. Um, yeah, so Line Fukuoka is like a branch office in Fukuoka. It's right next to uh, uh, Hakata Station. It's like you go out Hataka Station, take a left, see the Starbucks, and then 12 floors up, that's our office. And, <clears throat> and I, uh, yeah, we are, I think we're about 100 deliver over there, and, and then I work in a team with, there are several teams, I work, my team is about 10 people. And ten people, and then but we do extensive code reviews, and then to the point that like having a robot doing code review for us actually helped. Um, so that's why it's a subject. Uh, so if you have a scanner, this is the URL for this uh, this talk. So this is a self referential slide. So I'm I'm going to be uh, showing some code, not like some code like Pro code. So any, anybody here Pro before? And has anybody actually write Pro code before? Yay. Okay. So uh, I think most of most of the ideas are applicable, and then I think even most of the I think most of other languages they probably have seen the tool because like Pro language is a little bit difficult to to pass in my area. and then and uh, like it's a little bit behind from this regard, but sort of, we sort of we sort of managed to finish uh, many aspects of these. Uh, in this speech, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask. Uh, like feel free to interrupt me. I am very interruptible. Like most likely, I'm going to be out of time anyway. <laughs> All right. So, service said that you can find me. Uh, my ID on the network is Google Hot. That's my personal website. I'm doing mostly Perl for seven, eight years ish. And uh, I do. I also do Java and then recently Kotlin. And then, uh, like service like Kotlin, uh, not not really Android Kotlin. Um, yeah, well, I know very little about Android. So previously, I was mostly known for Project Opera Group, which is uh, I don't know. Like, that, that, I always say it's like RDM for Ruby and then Pro for, for Pro. Uh, so it's like a ver it's like an isolation manager. That's why, how I would phrase it today. And then in my previous work, I wrote a module called Pike. I previously was I previously worked in a company in the Netherlands, so I sort of invented this fake Dutch word. <laughs> so, and then it's a, it's a HTTP client that's very minimal and uh, therefore very fast. Um, the, it is now sort of wide and used internally in that company. And I heard Japan, uh, Yahoo Japan, they also have some use of this module. I'm not I'm sure, I just, this is like a rumor to me. Uh, so, but nowadays I also maintain for Line the SDK for uh, line chatbots. Well, this is a pro version of SDK, uh, but I am also more or less involved in the development of other other language versions. So they are all open source projects. Actually, everything I talk about are today are open source projects, except like for the team, 
like the job that supports me. Like the, there's only one thing that's not open source in, in this talk. So, which is this one. This, <laughs> this is not open source project, but so this, but the team I am I am in is called the Creators Market. I probably can show you the web page. Which is just this. Uh, so this is a system for everyone to upload their creations, which is our uh, stickers, uh, themes, emojis, uh, and then you can sell them online. So like, that's a fun. You can sell it inside in 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 this in the line platform. So people can buy other people's uh, sticker. Uh, so this is the entry point, like you, you create something, you draw something nice, this is where you go to upload your, your work, and then you find a price, we sell it for you. Um, it's a small, it's a small-ish platform, uh, but it actually, uh, so the team has like three front-end devs, uh, four service ideas. We have some other designer plus uh, product owners in a different office. Uh, the front end part is mostly Angular JS. Uh, the front end guys really want to sort of phase that out and then rewrite with Vue JS. So uh, uh, service side is a pro project uh, started about five years ago. Um, there's my SQL, Nginx, Memcached. So this is like a, a you, one might say this is a boring architecture, but it's actually the architecture that works perfectly well uh, and gives you money. So roughly speaking, the flow of uh, this teamwork is that the, like the whole company uses GitHub Enterprise. So it's like you basically work with GitHub with a different domain name. That's that's how it is. Um, so we create a new branch for each task, and then uh, we do something, and then we push the code, and then uh, it triggers a CI like testing process. And we basically iterate based on the results of the testing, and then there's a well, there are two processes where humans are involved. The one is code reviews that you are required to ask for at least one code reviews. For your changes uh, from from like any server side devs or any client side devs depends on your team. So I mean, at least one uh, reviewer is requires. Somebody else has to read your code. And before you release something for real, uh, there's human QA. So that there there's actually a team of human QA. They will do manual regression tests uh, after uh, before and after release actually. So. Before release, they do sort of they test specifically for the new things you added. After release, they will do some regression. And uh, but code review is the the topic that I want to uh, focus today. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, code review doing code review that's generally my uh, first task of a of a day, a typical day. I estimate that. Uh, it actually takes about thirty percent of my time. It's been roughly an hour or so, at least, per day, uh, just reading people's code. <clears throat> so like, it's actually quite like quite significant. Like, considering that I, have to, I also have to do meetings and stuff, uh, this is actually a big chunk of the time that I sort of deal with coding code. But there are there there are some like good good that I, that I can pull out of doing code reviews. Um, because in order to sort of do that properly, you need to really understand like everything, every piece of code in your repository, uh, as long as it's spec. So like this, this guy is doing implementing a new stuff, following a new specification. Like the reviewer, me, also has to do read a little bit about specification to at least like making sense of the change. So. Not only do I have to know why this has to be done this way, I will also need to know like, like how like, my colleague can all these. So uh, like just, by, just by reading and then by sometimes doing some manual tests of the new code, uh, well, I, I gain a lot of 
understanding of how the coding works. And, uh, of course, like doing coding is not just about reading. You need to produce some output. You need to be like sometimes you do the like play the blackface and then be the critique of uh, of your colleagues. Like like you say this does not make sense, or we do it this way, we do it that way. Like there will be some kind of uh, interactions online or offline like this. And but like it's better to be like. When it comes to code review, I think it's better to be honest rather than like, too polite, because like we know like the purpose is to have is to perfect the software rather than rather than like being, just being nice to each other. Uh, yeah. So roughly speaking, uh, when you are doing code reviews or when we do code reviews, we focus more on the readability of the code. Rather than the correctness of the code, <clears throat> I'll explain about. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more, and then we focus a little more on the maintainability rather than like the solution being the optimized one. Uh, so, so this is kind of like a preference or like a mindset what we're doing for reviews. Uh, so, in terms of reliability, uh, I'm I am mostly looking for like unconventional stuff that, or conventional stuff. Like, like we usually do solve this problem this way. So, if like some alternative way is found, then like people might might not like catch that and then do not recognize. Oh, this is a these two pieces of code that are doing the same thing. It's just they're do, they're, do, they're done in a different way. So, like having an unconventional style in the code that could affect uh, readability a little bit, or in Perl code or in pretty much every language, there's some level of quirks, like I call quirk magic and shenanigans. Uh, so, like there's sometimes you just, people's code just look weird, and you, you just cannot understand it. Like you stare there like ten minutes, you don't know what the hell it is. So then, that's also a big. Uh, no, no, for readability, uh, or or let's say, what was it? Like try not to be too clever. Just like like if you uh, if you write something that's actually too clever, people might actually have a problem understanding what you're trying to do. Or uh, mismatching style. Uh, so this is a little bit mix of what we recognize as coding style or uh, coding conventions. So, like, so it's Sometimes it's just about indentation and then decoration and then symbols in the right place with nice amounts of white spaces. Uh, sometimes it's also about, uh, for example, how you write like a, I guess an expression with uh, three ors in the end. It's like, like you say, do you say a or a and b and c or do you say not a and not b? And c? So like, how much? more than can you do in your brain. So that kind of affects uh, that kind of affects how people read it and then that kind of um, yeah that kind of becomes a team convention like, this, like the, the whole team sort of decided that when there are three Boolean logic put together we should we should use and instead of or so uh, but that's that's completely up to your team. That's not it's not determined. It's not like predetermined. There's no global standard. Or, and the very last part, uh, we generally want to prevent the random code waste in the code. Like if you commit something, then, and then you sort of look at it and you decide, well, this looks like it's doing nothing, or this like uh, is 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 producing some value that's never been used, then it's a waste. Why do you do that in the first place? Are we looking for exactly? Are we looking for side effect only? Probably should refactor. <clears throat> so, code waste is also a, uh, like a very important factor when it comes to maintainability. Like, in, like if you have code run, there are a lot of statement in your code that seems like it's doing nothing. But if they are not, then <clears throat> well, if they are not, then that's actually useful. But if they really do nothing, like the maintainer will have to then re restore them over and over just to conclude that they do nothing. Then that's a big waste of time. Uh, so, and then actually one important aspect of the 
readability of the code. It's just this, this sentence, like, can I just read it? Can I just understand it by reading through it? Like, if, so this is very pers personal, or this is very subjective, but I think together, like, the whole team should sort of find some balance. Uh, like, if I cannot, if I just read some code from my colleague and then I have no idea what his intention is, I probably should go talk to him and then decide that, decide a neutral style that we both can agree. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. That's where we come. All right. So, yeah, so this, the takeaway is, I think if you want to write some maintainable code, like at least you should make it understandable. That's a fair sentence or a fair logic. All right, so I will follow up on the. I would like to introduce some interesting tools that I found or I sort of developed, developed to uh, remove code bases. Um, so I, I sort of categorize them in four categories. Um, So, uh, format a literature tester, big refactor, or uh, <coughs> I don't know why I have test words. Formatter, so, formatter is the most trivial uh, part uh, for. So, it's like, I get this actually in co review. Some colleague says, you should have four space here. I said, all right. <laughs> so, like, so, this is very, uh, like, this is very nice, but it's a huge waste of humans' brain. <laughs> so you should have a software that is doing it. Like in Perl, there's a Perl Tidy, uh, the program called Perl Tidy. That it ha the, the tool has like three three hundred configura configurable options. But you can configure it once and then it's just there. Or I believe most of the editor they know how to indent stuff. Uh, otherwise, you should use it. Uh, so so this is mostly like about the team should. More or less agree on using tab or space, but please use it. Uh, uh, then the second category is like linter. So does anyone rec more or less recognize linter? Okay, great. So um, uh, so in the Perl ecosystem, CPAN, linter there are several implementation of linter, <coughs> and then there, well, there are several aspects. Uh, the, the easiest one is just try to compile it. It's, the dash C, and then there are Perl critique and Perl lint. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit more on Perl critique. There's also C that bought it, which is a database of uh, known vulnerabilities of certain modules. So it sort of it sort of scan your dependency tree and then decide like are you using something that's problematic or not? Then you should probably update. So this that's the kind of thing that a computer can do very easily, while humans cannot. Uh, for other language, there are a lot of things. ESLint, GoFix. GoFix actually, they actually refactored the code. It's actually pretty awesome. Um, and Tester is, I think, one of the most uh, uh, talked domain, uh, at least in the Perl's uh, ecosystem. People love talking about Test. Uh, so when, about, when I say Tester, I mean the tool like CI, uh, or uh, there's a concept of continuous testing. Basically, before, once you save your file, it immediately triggers a test. And then the, the successful or the failure of that are sort of posed back to you in your IDE or on the screen. So that you have a very quick feedback cycle that basically telling yourself that I'm doing something wrong. <clears throat> and then there's also some extended version of like something like au pair testing. Anybody here au pair testing? And then mutation test. All right, interesting. And then fuzzing. I think fuzzing. Yes, I think fuzzing is a little bit more uh, trendy topic because usually when there's an outage somewhere in public, fuzzing is involved, or uh, more or less involved. <coughs> uh, so these are some tools. I screw up my slides. And then refactor. So I, there's a, some tools in the Perl ecosystem, the very few tools, actually, uh, 
that you can use to sort of refactor your program semi automatically, semi manually. So it's like computer aided refactoring. I'm not going to go through those, <coughs> I'll just leave the keywords here. Alright, go ahead I'm going to touch format a little bit. Like, uh, I think format, like code format, is also a very important aspect of, uh, <coughs> of your code because it's like, it's like why you wear a, a suit in a two inch like be, like you look like it, if the code format or code format is consistent for old files then the way the the pace you read the code is more yeah, it's like breathable it's, it's, you sort of get used to it it's, like it's not in the way suddenly it's less space like it's more space and uh, <coughs> um, but this like this is mostly about Having the right amount of spaces, some like vertically and horizontally, and then, like I said, this is uh, your editor just says like if your colleague disagrees, then buy him drinks, um, and that's all. I have an editor configuration that does the same thing, right? And <clears throat> and in turn, uh, we so uh, like my team like we end up implementing. Most of our robotic code, code, code review, code review robots uh, in this domain, like it identifies uh, code wastes, <coughs> uh, unused stuff, like these variables. Uh, so, like if you wrote, if you write uh, Java or Go, then most of these are come with the compiler. But if you write JavaScript, Perl, uh, those are actually compiler to not know what's unused. Surprise. <laughs> Uh, so, so we write a additional software to actually scan the code, decide what looks like unused. Uh, but there's no way to be absolutely sure, certain. So we, instead of just sort of trigger an error, we submit a code review comment saying this looks like it's unused, and then human decide. Uh, okay. So progress. Perl is a, I think it's one of the best thing we have in the Perl community. Like it's really a critique, like it shouts at you, say you're doing this wrong. So I want to have a nice demo later. Too much work. So, so the point here is that it is a static code analysis system. So it, it does not compile the code, it sort of just scans through the tokens. But it's extendable, so you can write your own plugins, write your own rules. <coughs> like your team decide we should have seven spaces. Then okay, you can write a plugin to make sure there are seven places in the, spaces in the right place. Like okay, that makes sense. Okay. So, uh, so this is a book. Uh, like this book, this book sort of lists uh, like I think it lists like something like 120 policies that you can have in your project. Like these are these policies are not uh, like they are not they are like they are not good and evil uh, type. It's it's just like saying it's like use four spaces for indenting or use eight spaces for indenting. You can like both are fine. Like, but like pick one, like these, these a lot of things like those, like, like those kind of things. Uh, so the Perl critique module, more or less, is our model or prepared, followed by the content described in this book. I'm going to just try to show a small demo. Right, so this is 
So this is trying to uh, combine a number with a string with a plot with a numerical plot. Like, it doesn't make sense to me, but they do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if I copy this B, if I copy this. that in, so there's an option of a severity level, like that's how, that's the amount of, uh, amount of criticism that you want to have. That's, if I want to have the maximum level, okay. So this code has seven lines, but it has, I don't know, ten criticisms. So like, this is, so, Yeah, so these are all like very small stuff, like you can probably forget. It would be better if I turn it on. It's better. Yeah, so, so like this line is just saying you are not defining a version variable for your module. Like, fine. <laughs> like, so, like, I don't really need a version, I don't always need a version, or this line is just saying. You are, you are using a magic value of 10, and then, no, that's not a good, good idea. Define a constant or something. Like, define a, a, a name for it. It's it just using a magic value. And it also says, the only magic value you can use is 0 and 1 and 2. <coughs> this is a bit arbitrary, but at least, like, you can imagine there might be some useful case for this. Like, having too many magic values, uh, Code is probably not a good thing. So everything becomes black. Uh, all right. So so here's one example that I think that's very useful, and people make this kind of mistake quite a lot. So 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 in in, in Perl, there's a grab keywords basically that says you have an array of stuff. And then grab is like a filter. So oh, this is like taking a sub array of everything that matches this condition. So, but if you write, if you put that in an if statement, you ask, you're only asking for like do, you're only asking like is any one of them exist? But grab will take build the entire sub array. So this is actually too much work. Make sense. So this is actually a bad smell uh, of, uh, of code. What you should be using is something called first utility. As long as one exists, then I'm, good. I, I'm okay. So instead of building an entire sub array, just take a first, just find if there's one. So like Perl Predict sort of help you catch this. Like they, they catch like this if grab something something. They catch it, this pattern. Or uh, Regular expression, hey. Uh, so, uh, regular expression is very, like, it's almost like Perl is famous and infamous, infamous because of regular expressions. People do this. So, this is just saying is, is this uh, object variable one of these three values? But, like, people use a regular expression for this purpose. This could be a good thing or bad thing. It depends on how you do it. Calling things. Some people find this not readable. Oh, oh, no. Some people find this is more readable. Uh, I personally favor this a little, a little bit more, but this is a bit more, a little bit more uh, verbose. I guess there's some repetition in there. You can use the first subroutine again to reduce uh, the, the redundant keyword, redundant word. Or you can use this interesting module. There's a module called the Quantum Superposition. This was written in like early 2000, and then it's prepared for quantum computing. <laughs> so you can say is object equal to any of these. So that's how you read it. Or if you write Perl six, you have this. You literally have this. Like this is a valid Perl six program. This is like the best part of Perl six. Like, and uh, so for swiping like 
like cold waste or weird smelly code like this. I also wrote a different set of policy that called it too much code. Basically, this is like if you sort of just commit things with dead code inside, you can please remove that. So, um, generally speaking, having too many stuff in the code is a bit smell. And uh, there are also a lot of uh, more fixable, like fixable patterns, where like people put extra semicolon just so that sort of things are lined up nicely. I, I find that annoying. <laughs> But like, uh, or unuse hash key. Unuse hash key is actually a pretty common problem in Perl code because a lot of the time people have like a, a long living hash reference just holds random value, like arbitrary key values and then lived forever. And then over time, it's pretty difficult to track like, what's actually used, what's actually what's unused. <clears throat> or you have typo here, there. Sometimes you sometimes you have typo document. Or Variable name. So, like running spell checker on program variables, that's actually use, uh, meaningful. Um, and uh, I think this is the last part I want to talk about. That's the CI. So, CI, well, uh, they are these sort of enterprise solutions. Uh, my team, we use Drone CI. There's an in house Drone CI in the uh, line. And what we actually do is now not only we run test suites, we also run code review, like print pro critique, all those things I just sort of showed inside CI. And we also use this tool called Review Dog. So if you can if you cannot read that, that means that how about having a how about padding a review dog and do code review for you. Uh, <laughs> So this is a this is made in Japan. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is like a small snippet. You can combine these two tools together. So review dog recognize the output of many many other linters or formatters or uh, uh, that that actually reports like there's something wrong in this file, this line, this column, and then here's an error message. And then we, like review dog recognize all these. It uh, it parses those out and then it posts it. It posts a message to GitHub. It's basically, look at this. Um, yes. So, uh, so that that comment is a comment posted by Review Dog robot, basically saying, you you declare some module uh, to be used, but you don't actually use it later. So, so this is like. Like this is like like the, the kind of thing that robots does very nicely, but like human can easily miss this, or like human brains are too precious. They shouldn't do this. <laughs> so, uh, so this is sort of what we run this uh, to our code uh, for all uh, for all tests that we run uh, for all pull requests, and actually it turns out it runs pretty nicely. Uh, Save and audit. Uh, I plan to add this as a part. Uh, this is like this is you do this occasionally because so the vulnerability database they don't really update that often. Uh, but you like you want, but you want to run this like once per month or something. And uh, finally, I want to touch a little bit on mutation testing. This is a very interesting uh, topic uh, that I recently uh, engaged with. So this is very similar to fuzzing. But instead of feeding random parameters, it changes your code. So, so for example, say your code had its original version that it says if A and B do something, it mutates that, and then it says into a different operator or a different. Usually, it mutates the operator. And what it then do is that, like, like say you run the test for the for the original version, and then bless you, everything passed. And then, if you if you run a test for mutant and nothing fails, you actually have a problem. Either your test is not covering enough, or your code is doing the wrong thing and you don't know. So so then, uh, this is very actually very informative, but this is also very uh, computationally heavy. 
because the concept is that you change one operator in your entire code base and you run the test. Uh, most likely, you're not going to catch anything, so this is very, uh, this will spend a lot of time. Um, okay, I think.